Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for uh, attending. Welcome to our home. The um, lecture tonight on my thoughts will be on reading versus speaking to God. You know, I was wondering the other day, as, I, as an Orthodox Jew, I pray three times a day. I began to think that when I pray, do I read to God or do I speak to God? Uh, the two scenarios are totally different. If you read to someone, all they need to do is be in attendance. However, if you speak to someone, then there should be some form of interaction, uh, connection. Now, if you pray, by the way, as one would read a book, which means only with your eyes, no articulation, truth is you haven't prayed. In order for prayers to be accepted before God Almighty, they must be articulated. Again, as we say, Shema Yisrael, which translates to mean, hear, O Israel. So one can only hear that which is, which is spoken. Now, reading to someone may well put them to sleep or allow their minds to wander. The subject that you're speaking about or how articulate a speaker that you may be may make a difference. We see that the social platform TED Talks, an acronym for technology, entertainment, and design, that speakers are only given 18 minutes to present their talk based on a Jewish belief that the number 18 works out perfectly. Since 18 is the numerical value, the, the, the number of the Hebrew word chai, life, the number is telling us that any lecture that goes on for more than 18 minutes, life, is already starting to kill us. So getting back to the original question, do we read or speak to God? I would hope that everyone who opens a prayer book at some time through their prayers, at least thinks of God and tries to connect to him. After all, isn't that why they are there? I find it interesting that in many times what we see as an advantage may well be very limited. Think of a Jewish individual who, when they were an adult, decide that they now want to connect to God, become religious. So they go to an Orthodox synagogue to pray. They open up their prayer book and they smile. Hmm. Going to Sunday school wasn't such a waste of time after all. The letters in the prayer book look familiar, and so are some of the words. You have no idea what the words mean, but somehow you're able to follow along, even if you are compelled to skip some of the words or even complete paragraphs at times. So let's look at another scenario. A secular Jewish person decides that though they have had no formal Jewish background, they're still Jewish. And they think, that, well, you know, it may well be time to connect to their roots, to their God. And so they go to an Orthodox synagogue to pray. They open up a prayer book and they see all types of writing that they have seen throughout their life, but they have absolutely no idea how to read or translate the language. But all is not lost. The prayer book is translated in English they can still pray and connect to God. So even though they can't read Hebrew, but they can still participate with a little direction, actually very efficiently. Now the person without any background may actually amazingly have an advantage over the individual who went to Sunday school and already knows how to read Hebrew. Since they are praying in English, they understand the gist of each and every prayer they recite. If and when they learn how to read Hebrew, they may not reach the point where they can translate every word of the prayers, but they do have a general idea of what each prayer is saying. The other person who went to Sunday school and learned how to read Hebrew as a child may well spend the rest of their life repeating words that they really don't understand. They will then be reading to God, not speaking. Don't think that it's only Balchuvas. Again, those individuals who are nearly returning to a religious lifestyle who read to God. They may actually be at a one step up. What we call an FFB, which stands for from or religious from birth. Many times they don't even read to God. Prayer for many of them has become routine. Some of them know the prayers by memory. So they just repeat the same words over and over again with little or no thought about what they are saying or to whom they are saying it to. 
They pray at a speed that makes it very difficult for a mouth to articulate and an ear to hear. Next time you go to a gas station, look at the numbers rolling by as the gas is pouring into your gas tank. Try to say the numbers. <laughs> Impossible. Your mouth just can't form coherent sounds that fast. At best, sounds would be garbled. And that's what people sound like when they pray to God. Prayer in Hebrew is called tefillah taled, a connection of the heart. In our prayers, we have the ability, the honor, and privilege to address our Father in heaven with any and every need that we have. No thought, no request is too small or trivial to be discussed with your Father in heaven. He cares. You need to know that though there are some 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, that you, you are special. And God your Father wants to give his undivided attention to you. Don't you think that we should do the same? He deserves that we address him properly, articulate our words, connect our thoughts to the moment at hand. He wants our love and we can barely give him our attention. In the morning, we're half asleep and we have to get to work. In the evening, we're just too tired after a full day's work. And in the afternoon, in the middle of our work day, well, we are totally distracted. So we may read the words, but are we really speaking to God? Are we connecting? You know, my cousin once told me a story of a man who was out in the forest and lost his way. The sun was about to set, and he hadn't prayed the afternoon prayer yet. So he sat down by a tree and looked up to heaven. He began to address God. He said, Dear Father in heaven, I know that I'm a foolish person. I managed to get myself lost in the forest. In addition, now is the time for praying the afternoon service, and I don't have a siddur, a prayer book, with me. I wish I did, but I don't know the prayers by memory. So, what, I'm, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit here and repeat the Aleph base, the Hebrew alphabet, over and over again. My prayer to you is that you and your great mercy please take all of these letters and turn them into words. May you turn those words into sentences and those sentences into paragraphs. May this be counted before you as if I prayed the afternoon prayer with all of its deep meanings and praises. It was said in heaven that this man's prayer was the greatest prayer brought before God that day. Speaking to God, not reading to God. When we use the Hebrew word tefillah, prayer, it, it many times is a reference to the Amida, the standing prayer. It is also referred to as the Shemona Esrei, which translates to mean the 18 blessings. There, are, there were originally 18, however, due to the increase of informers and heretics within the Jewish people. The rabbis added a prayer to punish these individuals and a blessing to protect the populace from their insidious plans. So today there are 19 blessings, with the later, latter sages adding one more. But the name has remained the same, the Shemona Esra. So the Amida, again, which means to stand, because we stand for the prayer, is connected to one of the holiest prayers that we recite before God. There is a formula to, that the Amida, the prayer, follows. Out of the 18 blessings, the first three and the last three are identical in all Amidas throughout the year. The first three, pardon me, the, the, all throughout the year, which are 365 days of the year, every day the same. The only thing that changes is the middle blessing or blessings um, throughout the week. We have 13 middle blessings. These are blessings of requests for all of our needs. During the Shabbat or the Yom Tovim, the holidays, the middle blessing is connected with the theme of the day. Again, the formula instituted by the Anshe Knesset Agdol, the men of the Great Assembly, is that in the first three blessings, we recite praise of God. And in the last three blessings, we recite prayers of gratitude to God. Thank you. In neither the first three nor the last three, may we offer up personal requests to God. The same is true during the Shabbat and the Yom Tovim, the holidays. We make no personal requests in the Amida. The exception, of course, would be Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, where we do make personal requests. 
So based on what I just told you, I find it interesting and that if you translate the last three prayers in the Amida, you will find many requests. From the first of these three blessings, the Ritzay, which means look with favor, which is a request to God to reinstitute the temple service. To the last of these three blessings, Sim Shalom, which means bestow peace, where we ask God for goodness and blessings, life, graciousness, kindness, and mercy upon us and upon all your people Israel. I just mentioned that one may not present requests in the last three blessings, yet we see that two out of the three blessings are really all about requests. How we understand this? From the wording of these last three blessings, we learn an important lesson about our relationship with God Almighty, our Father in Heaven. When you've been kind to an individual and have helped them numerous times, imagine if that person asked to speak to you and said that he wanted to thank you for all the many times that you helped him in the past. Then with a wide smile on his face, he tells you that he no longer needs your help and that now, thanks to you, he can stand on his own two feet. Both of you would be happy that you would no longer have a relationship based on need. And now the two of you could share a relationship with each other based on your company rather than your money. So the change in status would be mutually satisfying. However, our relationship with God Almighty, our Father in Heaven, is totally different. There is never a time, never a place, where we don't need or want His assistance. You know, years ago, <clears throat> I bought my house. I arrived at the mortgage company 15 minutes early. I thought about opening up my book of Psalms, Tehillim, a book of prayers authored by King David, and religious people have developed the custom of reciting Psalms whenever they are in need of God's <clears throat> special assistance. So it just so happened that at the time I just closed on two other houses and I had enough money in my bank account to buy the houses for cash. So I thought, why bother God? <laughs> yeah, you guessed it. It was a transaction from hell. But I learned an invaluable lesson. I always bother God. So this is what the last three blessings in the media are teaching us. The way that you say thank you to a person is by thanking them for the past and assuring them that you will not be bothering them in the future. You're happy and so are they. With God Almighty, the scenario is quite different. The greatest way that we can thank God for all that he has done for us is by saying to him, thank you for all that you have done for me in the past. And from the past I see just how much I still need you in the present and in the future. So in the Amida, there are specifically two prayers where you can insert not just thoughts, which can be done at any time and in any place. In these two prayers, we can actually interrupt our recitation of the words of the prayer and speak to God in any language that we are familiar with. Speak to God. The first is in the eighth of the prayers of request of the Amida where we ask God for good health, rifa'enu, heal us. After the Hebrew words, l'chal makoseinu, to all of our wounds, after we say these words, we are permitted to articulate the names of the people who need divine assistance with their health issues. If possible, we mention the person's Hebrew name and their mother's Hebrew name. As a fallback position, we can use their English name and that of their mother, or even a combination of both. Again, in the 13th, the last of the requests, in the Shema Koleinu, in the Amida, in the prayer, again, Shema Koleinu, which translates to mean, hear our voice, we are permitted to insert our personal requests and feelings. You would think that the prayer would begin with the request for God to Shomea Tefilosenu, to hear our prayers. But no, we say Shema Koleinu, hear our voice. Our true strength comes from the blessings that Yitzchak gave to his son, Yaakov. Kol, kol Yaakov. The voice is the voice of Yaakov. Our true strength is the cry of a child to their loving father. It's not based on merit or even need. It is based on love. The love that God has for us. The love that a father has for his children. 
He therefore hears the cry even before he hears the request. Again, the Hebrew word for rekam al teshivenu, you should not turn us away empty-handed. After those words, we are permitted to say or request anything that we want for ourselves, our families, or any Jew or non-Jew alike that we feel needs divine assistance. There are no rules, no etiquette that you must follow. It's just a private conversation between you and your Father in Heaven. Don't waste the opportunity. He is listening, so speak to Him. He cares. There are those who complain that we all pray out of the same prayer book, and we basically say the same prayers day after day. They find it boring and monotonous. The truth is anything that you look upon as an obligation, a requirement, is bound to become a burden. You know, there's a story told of a rich man who had outgrown the vault where he kept all of his gold, silver, precious jewels, and his valuable documents. He had built a new and larger vault on top of a hill. And on the day that he had his servants move all of his wealth from the lower vault to the upper vault, a new one, he and the chief of police stood together off to the side of the hill. They both watched as the servants were going up and down the hill, carrying his riches and sacks on their shoulders. The rich man turned to the chief of police and pointed to one of his servants. He told the chief to have his men arrest that servant. He was carrying rocks, not treasure. He said to the chief of police that the servant had stolen the contents of his sack and had replaced them with rocks. So the chief of police told one of his officers to tell the servant to drop his sack and open it. And sure enough, it was filled with rocks. They arrested the servant and took him away. At that point, the chief of police turned to the rich man and said, You know, I knew you were a shrewd businessman, but I never dreamt that you were a prophet. <laughs> a prophet? The rich man looked confused. Well, the chief said, You were standing next to me the whole time. How could you possibly know that the sack that your servant was carrying was filled with rocks and not treasure? The rich man smiled. And he said, I'm not a prophet. You see, it's really very logical. When you're carrying treasure, it's light. It seems as if it's carrying itself. However, when you're carrying rocks, hmm, then you have to work. His servant was working too hard. And so too with us. If we try to speak to God instead of reading to God, we may well find that our whole praying experience may change. This is true anywhere and everywhere that you find yourself. Whatever you need, whatever your need may be, talk to him. He's always listening. In fact, the word prayer is an acronym for please respond after you examine request. So bottom line, how should we pray? The Arizal says that if one cannot understand the words of the prayers, he should just have in mind that he wishes to connect to the thoughts that the men of the Great Assembly, Sheikh and Nessus Agdolo, infused into the words of the prayers when they instituted prayer. In this way, one can fulfill their obligations, and then they should place their trust in God's judgment and ask Him to give them exactly what they really need. The Arizo learned this out from the Paraduma, the red heifer, the ultimate statute. It was said that when the Kohen, a priest, would administer the rite of purification on someone who had been defiled by the dead, the Kohen could not know what were the deep Kabbalistic thoughts that he should meditate on. After all, it was only Moshe, our teacher himself, who was privy to the deepest meanings of this statute. So the Kohen, the priest, while administering the ritual, would think that he wanted to connect to the thoughts of Moshe, and by concentrating his thoughts to Moshe's, he would then be able to fulfill his obligation properly. This thought should be in our prayers at all times, whatever our spiritual level, but especially when we find ourselves with only a little time to speak to God. Don't ever think that it's a waste of time. He cherishes every moment. So let us call out to him, speak to him, much like a child speaking to his father, and say that the time is now for the coming of Mashiach Sakano. May he come quickly and in our time. 
Again, thank you very much for listening. Bless you all with health, wealth, health, wealth, happiness, all the good that God can give. Again, it should all be revealed. And again, thank you again for listening and attending. And again, if there's any topic that you would like to hear about, please, the uh, email address is on the screen, on the bottom of the screen. Please let me know, and I'll be more than happy to try to look into it. God bless. Be well. Shabbat Shalom.